17 years after the events of the first game, Heather Mason, on her way back home from a day at the mall, is approached by a private investigator who inadvertently triggers a series of horrific events that'll eventually lead Heather to the town of Silent Hill. It's not only a physical journey for Heather, but a mental one too, as the dark magics that envelop the town spreads beyond its boundaries in order to draw her back to Silent Hill, and through this journey, she'll encounter many monsters that are symbolic manifestations created out of her own fears. In this video, I'll be taking a look back at the creatures of Silent Hill 3 and analysing them each in turn, and if you do enjoy this video and want to see more, leave a like and subscribe, that way you can stay up to date on all future videos I put up. Before getting on with the topic of the video, it's best to provide some context to the monsters of not only Silent Hill 3, but all the creatures in the series, to get a better understanding of what's happening to Heather, as their purpose of existence differs from person to person. Heather is the reincarnation of both Cheryl Mason and Alessa Gillespie. Alessa's mother Dahlia was one of the leaders of a religious cult known as the Order, who tried to birth their dark god into the world by using ritual magics on Alessa, but Alessa became too powerful to control, and was able to split her spirit from her body and hide from the cult by enveloping the town in a dense fog. To further prevent the cult from using her, she split her soul into two parts, one half of this soul changed into a physical baby, who was left to be found outside of time by the Masons. This baby was named Cheryl. Whether this was Alessa's design, or because of the order meddling with dark magics, monsters began to appear in the town. Years later, against Alessa's will, Cheryl was compelled to return to Silent Hill, where the two half-souls eventually found each other and merged into one. Dahlia used Harry's desire to find his daughter so that he could get close enough to Alessa and use an artifact to weaken her. She's then forced to give birth to the cult's dark god, but Harry destroys it and is given a reward from a grateful Alessa. Before dying, she conjures him a new baby daughter, he names Heather, who grows up for the next 17 years with the memories of Cheryl and Alessa. In the present timeline, the Order, now led by Alessa's childhood friend Claudia Wolfe, seeks Heather to perform a new birthing ritual, and uses the dark magics of Silent Hill in an attempt to bring her back to the town. The monsters that she encounters in the game are not only symbolic manifestations from Heather's subconscious mind, but also from memories of Cheryl and Alessa. The monsters are created out of negative emotions brought on by either the game series' antagonists or are self-projections like in the case with Heather Mason. So with that all in mind, let's take a look at the monsters. These are one of the first monsters Heather will encounter early in the game. They appear as a tall and deformed female figure, similar in appearance to the mandarins from the second game, wearing black high boots and a dress. Their arms are made longer by the blood-stained padding that is wrapped around a bone fragment, and its face appears flat and distorted with large lips. Later in the game, they appear more dirty and bloodier, and when shooting one of these, their rotten flesh turns black and green. Though they move around slow on tiptoes, their size more than makes up for their lack of speed, as they're more difficult to run by in smaller areas, and have far-reaching attacks. The closer will either strike Heather by thrusting one of their arms forward, or protrudes its arm bone like a blade to slice at her. They'll have a new quick attack later in the game where the closer will swing their arms around themselves. The likely reason for its appearance is from her memories as a lesser, as it looks similar to a figure in one of her childhood drawings found on the floor of her bedroom near the end of the game, and like some of Alessa's other drawings that came to life in the first game, this tall figure may have been created from her fear and hatred of Dahlia, as all she ever wanted was a kind and loving mother, instead of the abusive monster she had. The creature also appears to have around its body medical tapes and stitches to further support Alessa as a victim of physical abuse. This, along with the high boots Heather wears and the dress worn by Alessa, all merge into this nightmarish visage of the Closer. These are the very first enemies seen in the game within Heather's nightmare sequence. The dog's heads, as their name implies, is split right down the center, and each half moves like two separate entities. They also appear to have bandaged strips wrapped around their burned flesh. 
Heather can often pass by without provoking them into attacking if the double heads are distracted with beef jerky, but when they do attack, they'll either launch forwards to do a jumping bite, or use its double heads to clamp onto Heather's leg to gnaw on. As they're the first creatures encountered in the other world, they may symbolise Cerberus, who's a multi-headed guardian of the underworld in Greek mythology, but to Heather, the double head may likely be influenced by Alessa, as dogs appeared in the original game, created from Alessa's nightmares. Their burned flesh and bandage wraps are a reflection of Alessa's anguish after her failed immolation in the ritual to birth the cult's god that led to her hospitalisation. The double head might even represent the duality of Heather's good to Alessa's evil. The Numbody are pale-skinned, bipedal monsters that appear in two different sizes. Their skin is covered in prominent veins, with two tail-like protrusions in the rear end and a large hole on its head. They seem to waddle like a baby taking its first steps, and attack either by jumping forward to ram their heads into Heather, or do a horizontal swipe with their head. The larger variants are a little more stronger, but have the same type of attacks. Its appearance seems to represent a developing fetus, with some sort of embryonic tail. It could be that Heather's body and mind are telling her that she is already pregnant by the dark magics of Silent Hill, and will eventually give birth to the cult's god. The larger sized creatures could further support this point, as the fetus is slowly growing within her. The tail could represent one that a fetus has during its early development stage in the mother's womb, and the noise the numb body makes even sounds baby-like. Another one seen early on in the game are these legless creatures. They appear to be two human torsos linked together by the waist with their arms tied behind their backs in some sort of mechanical device that has a pair of long pointed metal legs. The pendulum's skin looks burned with dirty bandages wrapped around their faces and blades nailed onto their heads. They are either seen floating in the air by means of spinning on its axes or walking along the ground on its metal legs. Its two main attacks happen in the air. It either moves slowly toward Heather to slash her with their head blades, or stops spinning to thrust its pointed legs at her. If Heather shoots at the pendulum, it will attack more aggressively by spinning faster toward her. They'll also attack on the ground by using their head blade to slash downwards. And like the numbody creatures, there are various sized pendulums found throughout the game. The name pendulum is derived from the creatures rotating its bodies. They can be seen as another representation of the duality between the light and darkness of Heather and Alessa, each side trying to dominate the other one, and are thus trapped in a perpetual circle. The skin burns and the bandages are a reminder of Alessa's suffering. The first boss battle is against a giant creature that has a protective outer shell to avoid harm from weapons. The shell opens to reveal a set of human looking teeth, and a bunch of tendons that connects the mouth to its outer hide. Its mouth can appear from any of the three dark openings either side of Heather, only to switch positions after a certain amount of time. When it attacks, the split worm will launch towards Heather and bite her. A more deadly version of its bite happens if Heather is further away, and will warn her of the attack by raising its mouth to scream before it strikes. It does another long range attack by slamming its head against the ground to cause a quake. It may also sometimes crawl out of its place to reposition across the room, and mow down Heather along the way. There may be several possible meanings to the split worm. There's a possible connection to Alessa, as the first boss in Silent Hill 1, called the Split Head, is from a childhood fairy tale she once read, about a monster whose only weakness was to shoot into its open mouth. The shell opening could also be seen as a mouth that reveals another mouth from within that could further support the idea of duality between Heather and Alessa, or it may be symbolic of Heather's pregnancy, a monster themed around maternity, like a baby emerging from a womb. Heather first encounters one of these obese creatures sleeping face down in the subway. They appear as a faceless, naked humanoid with rotten and bloodied flesh covered with open sores that pus oozes out of. Although they usually move slowly, they can and will often run towards Heather to close the gap between them. Alternatively, if she's too far away and they can't be bothered to pursue, they'll instead drop to the floor to rest for a moment. Their attacks are surprisingly fast, the main one being a double hammer punch. If Heather tries to attack one from behind, the insane Cancer will do a 180 spin with a quick following punch, and when on the ground, they can swing their arms around to clear a way for them to get back up. 
The name for these monsters is derived from a cancerous mass that grows out of control, but the name shouldn't be taken literally, as this is a maternal themed story, so the creatures are more likely a representation of an unwanted growth within Heather, such as the god fetus that was placed inside of her that is rapidly growing like some sort of disease that she doesn't want. The Slurper is initially seen in the sewers lying motionless under a bridge, and disappears when Heather returns to the location. They appear as a male wearing a pig skull with teeth at the end of its fleshy snout, and like their name implies, the creatures can be seen to feed off of meat and slurping up blood. Their filthy clothing looks stitched together, and have arm paddings to cover their hands, similar to the Closer's arm design. In the other world within Brookhaven Hospital, the Slurpers appear to have animated blood over their entire body. They move around on all fours like it's pretending to be an animal, and are often distracted with eating meat on the floor. They sometimes appear out of crawl spaces or from under beds to attack. The two main types of attacks it does are either pulling Heather off of her feet, or grabbing hold of her to bite at. Their distant attack is fast, as they scurry towards Heather to mow her down with their club-like arms. This monster's creation is more difficult to interpret, as the game designers didn't have every creature to be symbolic in mind, but the closest thing to the Slurpers and the story's theme on birth can be found in Japanese folklore. Known as Sankai, this monstrous being is said to be born in place of a human baby if care is not given during the pregnancy. If not caught in time, the creatures would escape and hide under its mother's home, lying in wait to kill her. This thing only appears once, blocking Heather's exit from the Otherworld Hilltop Center. It's not a threat to her, and she can't harm it with any weapons. It will eventually disappear, allowing Heather to leave the building after she reads an excerpt from a fairy tale book. Based on its human looking feet, it appears to be a tall humanoid wrapped in a skin blanket that's stitched together, while the head is either covered or replaced entirely for one that resembles the head of the closer. Its large mouth twitching and twisting, while a second mouth head is placed on this creature's chest. It seems to be suspended by its intestines within a cylindrical prison, surrounded by spikes and a curtain of rotten flesh. The glutton seems to be a manifestation of the same creature in a fairy tale that either Heather or possibly a lesser once read. The name comes from one of the seven deadly sins. Gluttony is the overindulgence of drinking and eating, a name appropriately given for a double mouthed monster that eats people within the fairy tale. Only when Heather reads the final part is when the creature vanishes. Claudia may have had a hand in conjuring this monster from the book that she also read to force Heather to remember her true self, something Claudia has been trying to do throughout the game while preparing Heather for the birthing ritual. Tu fui ego eris, translated from Latin, what what you are, I was. What you will be, I am. And means that death is unavoidable. Heather will have to die in order for God to be born. Once Claudia is satisfied that Heather has read this memento mori by hearing it said out loud, Claudia lets her exit the hilltop center for the next phase of her plan. Heather will fight the missionary on the apartment rooftop after it murders her father, Harry Mason. He's a tall figure who appears to look more human than most of the other enemies. He wears some kind of fleshy sack for a mask with a bloody butcher's apron and long red rubber gloves. The missionary is a fast attacker who's able to run circles around Heather to hit her from behind, and uses two tomfa-like weapons with retractable blades. He can attack by thrusting the blade forward with either the slow or quick variations, do a charging blade slice, and if knocked to the ground, he can get back up with a counter attack by swinging the blades around him. If shot at, he raises the weapon in front to shield himself. The word missionary means someone sent on a religious mission to promote or convert others to their faith. In this case, Claudia orders this person to murder Heather's father, Harry Mason, in order to build her anger and hatred, believing that they are the necessary means to enable Heather to give birth to their god. As she won't convert, Claudia manipulates Heather's emotions to ensure the order's goals are accomplished. Claudia leaves her to kill the missionary to further send Heather onto a furious path of revenge all the way back to Silent Hill. By the time Heather reaches the chapel complex at the end of the game, there'll be another enemy type called Scraper that look like smaller and weaker versions of the missionary, but make up for it in numbers. Whether they are members of the Order, manifestations by Claudia Wolf, 
or maybe even by Heather herself, because of her anger toward the missionary for killing her father, their appearance here serves Claudia's purpose to perpetuate Heather's negative emotions in preparation for the final hours before the birthing ritual. The nurses appear in Brookhaven Hospital. They look less deformed than the ones from the last game, having a human face with dark hair. Their bloodstained uniform, when looking at it from the front, shows a reserved attire with the skirt down by the knees, but when seeing them from behind, the nurses look like they're wearing a mini skirt. They'll mainly hobble around while hunched forwards, only straightening their body for a moment to attack, but with some provocation, they'll close the distance between them and Heather by running towards her. Armed with the pipes, they'll either thrust the pipe forward at mid-range, or swing at Heather if they're close enough. With the revolver, they'll either fire a single round if she's far away, or pistol whip Heather up close. The nurses are from Heather's memories of Alessa's hospitalization and of Lisa Garland, who took care of her. Claudia's father will appear in the basement of the hospital as a deformed humanoid, with sodden skin that looks like he's been underwater for too long, and it's turned an unnatural colour. His hands have changed into a pair of large bone-like claws, and his eyeless face seems to have small creatures slithering from the holes in his cheeks. Leonard appears to be amphibious, as he can stay underwater for long periods of time. It's while he's submerged that he can bolt around the room. When he surfaces, he moves slow, but is able to attack. He does a slow horizontal swipe with either his long arms, or does a quicker version of this attack when emerging from the water. There's no symbolism behind this monster, as Leonard Wolf is an actual person rather than a creation of dark magic. He has a strong fanatical belief in the Order's faith, and often used violence and fear on Claudia to shape his daughter into a pure believer. His cruelty paid off as Claudia became equally fanatical, but grew to hate Leonard, and in the later years, the pair had different goals, as Leonard believed that paradise was only for the worthy, while Claudia wanted to welcome everyone into their faith. And at some point, he was institutionalised in Brookhaven Hospital after stabbing someone over a religious dispute. It's unclear whether Leonard is actually human, and that Heather is only seeing a monster from her point of view, or if it's Claudia using the powers of Silent Hill to transform him into the monster she grew up to despise. This doppelganger appears on the descending carousel as a darker version of Heather, with dirty clothing, rotten bloody skin, and black hair. Alessa will wield one of four types of weapons, switching to the next after Heather defeats her, evaporating into the floor and reappearing with a new one. She'll often try to parry Heather's attacks throughout the battle. Starting with a knife, Alessa will do a fast melee slice attack. Her second weapon is a handgun that Alessa will either fire off from a distance or pistol whip Heather up close. Her third weapon is the steel pipe that she'll swing for greater damage than the knife. The final weapon is a submachine gun that Alessa either fires off or does a pistol whip. The memory of Alessa is a manifestation of Heather's subconscious mind that is trying to prevent God's birth also, but in a more extreme way as the doppelganger is trying to kill Heather. Her dying message on the floor, written in blood, reveals that her reason was to free themselves from the horrors that will happen after birthing this God. Seen throughout the game is this mysterious figure, garbed in what looks to be surgical wear. With red rubber gloves, a dirty apron, and a faceless skin mask, it almost looks as if it's preparing to deliver a baby in its own twisted way, and tattooed on both of his shoulders appears to be the mark of Metatron. Heather first encounters Valtiel when she's transitioning into the other world for the first time. He poses no threat to her at any point in the story, only appearing in the background in the middle of some kind of disturbing activity. It's only when Heather finally decides to go to Silent Hill in pursuit of Claudia, does Valtiel appear more frequently, as if it's indicating the time of God's birth is nearing. He makes several appearances at Brookhaven Hospital, where he's either seen turning a valve or assaulting what looks to be one of the nurses. He continues to do either of these things toward the end of the story, while at other times he just appears to be watching over Heather, right up to the point the god is born, where Valtiel shifts his focus to nurturing it. The turning of valves represents the cycle of rebirth, and implies that he has control over the shifting of the two worlds. In the chapel complex, Valtiel is seen turning another valve beneath two hanging pair of female legs that represent Alessa and Cheryl. 
The name Valtiel means servant of God. He doesn't appear to be a manifestation of anyone's subconscious mind, but rather a kind of dark angel whose purpose is to watch over Heather to ensure the birth of God. The seal of Metatron that's seen on his body is named after an angel in real life religions to be of great importance. One who sits beside God, provides guidance to other angels and shows mortals the way to God. The god appears as a giant, monstrous being whose face resembles a lesser, who was Heather's original identity. This is because the manifestation of God takes on the appearance of its mother, but with its attempted abortion, as well as the hate and anger inside Heather and Claudia's hasty rescue of it, the god is improperly developed and appears deformed and skeletal. Her upper body has no skin, showing discoloured muscle. The hips and legs lack any flesh and ends at the knees, while the bloody spine is exposed and barely connects her entire body together. Although it's fixed in one spot, the creature can move into one of two positions. Upright, she's protected from harm, with her face hidden behind a veil, and will either swipe one of her long arms across Heather if she's close enough, or conjure fire along the floor that arcs towards the protagonist. The other position is one where the god is hunched forwards, where she's more vulnerable, but no less dangerous, as she can still summon flames that will bolt towards Heather, or if it's close enough, either perform a quick arm swipe or even a headbutt. The whole story of the game centres on this god, as Claudia wants to birth it while Heather's trying to prevent it. The suffering and loss of Heather's father is what Claudia needs to nurture her negative emotions, believing it's the only way for God to understand what its purpose is. According to Claudia, humanity has become too sick and corrupted and needs to be renewed, and for God to bring a happy and peaceful paradise to Earth. Where there's no evil or suffering, it has to first kill every soul on the planet and cleanse their sins with fire, hence the creature's power to summon flames. But in its state of weakness, Heather was able to kill the god and prevented Earth's destruction. Hey everyone, thanks for watching the video and I hope you enjoyed it. As I've already mentioned, if these videos gain some interest, then I'll do more. I'd like to do a monster analysis video on each of the Resident Evil games and it can open up into a whole new series. Up next will be more Easter eggs and references videos, so look out for them. If you're new to the channel and are interested in any of these, then subscribe. That way you can stay up to date on all future videos I put up. And once again, thanks to all of you who have subscribed and are helping to make this channel grow. So until the next video, bye everyone.